Julia, this is fine. All righty, all righty. Welcome everybody to our talk today, our fantastic talk. This is two middle-aged and one senior middle-aged individual. You can decide which one is which. Ranting about the gaming industry today. <laughs> Wait, who's who? Who's who? By the way, I have no idea. <laughs> I think I, I think I'm the more senior one. <laughs> well, yeah, yes. But, judging by judging by years of gaming experience, yes, I I agree. I was going to say judging by lack of hair, but you know it is what it is. <laughs> Man, the state of gaming today is a topic we've been going back and forth with for quite a few years now. A few years yeah. now. Uh, and it has come to a point, uh, kind of like a boiling point for somebody like myself, who is now, you know, securely, firmly at 50% of his age, uh, pretty much. And so now I can look back and, you know, from, from the, the, uh, the year that I started to game, which was 1992. And I look at where we have come to now as the gaming industry and us being part of the industry as gamers, where... Mm -hmm. Where have we come to, and why this has come to a point where we have to rant about certain things? Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's not just sort of just not just a rant. It's like a general uh, disagreement with the direction the industry is going. You know, it sort of feels like that we as consumers do have this right to put this you know information forward that we're really dissatisfied how things are going. So. I think we really should just dive into some of the bigger news that's happening and then really get into the nitty gritty of stuff and why it's just we got into the shit show that it is today. And uh, right, yeah, fantastic. Sony. <laughs> what better topic? I, yeah. Then... It, it, it's like Sony's been taken over by the suits, you know? Kind of like just, just overall direction and, and everything that they're trying to do. It kind of feels like I mean, I want to come to Concord, but I think before we get into Concord, I just want to build the base up from there. So think of it this way, uh, Helldivers 2, fantastic game, super, super, you know, uh, huge followership, people were raving about it. It was top on the list of active users. And then I think some dumbass needed to get his PSN user metrics up and made it a mandatory requirement that you have to log into a PSN account and completely tank the game. And ironically, just today, uh, I think God of War Ragnarok was also came out for the PC. Same issue. You have to have a PSN account to play it on I PC. did not know that. Really? Yeah, it was just yesterday. Wow. I think it was yesterday. And I mean, what's going on? I don't need a PSN account. Stop forcing your suckage on me. What, what is going on? From what I know, from a few months back, I thought they had learned their lesson. Like, okay, so we are going to undo the change that we did with Helldivers 2. And apparently yeah. there was some rollback in some some regions, not our, not us, not yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, <laughs> that's news. That is news for me coming into this, uh, <laughs> uh, coming into this call of ours. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, there, and I think this is not just a Sony PlayStation thing. It seems to be a generally a Sony thing. But the decisions they are taking in the movie, uh, on the movie side, <laughs> with Spider Man, Spider alternate Spider Verse. Uh, Craven verse and a Morbius verse and all of those, uh, and it, it seems to be you know carrying over to the video game side of Sony uh, operations as well. The decisions are yeah, bizarre. I, I can't believe like people are actually able to convince Sony to re-release Morbius in, in in cinema by putting together it's Morbing time and got it trending and they thought oh wow look it's trending let's get it in. I, where, where, it where is kind of sad. It is kind of what sad. You know, somebody who's been reading comics has been a Spider-Man fan in the comics for the longest time, and to see what they have, they are, this, what Sony solely is doing with the Spider-Man verse, uh, other than the the animated uh, part, the live action, what are they doing? And uh, and uh, Sony really was has been has been my as a gamer, my champion successor to a Nintendo. I have been a N Nintendo guy ever since. And Sony was, you know, since the PS2, just uh, the savior of video games. And certainly you know, yeah. that is also crashing and burning, just like the Spider-Verse. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of seems like, and I think just getting to the topic, like Concord, I think is a fantastic example. Like they spent $400 million. Actually, no one is sure about the development costs, but the numbers that are coming up are, are somewhere around, like I think a couple of days ago, 
Uh, actually, five hours ago, so an article on Forbes has mentioned that it cost them approximately $400 million to make. And it, it, it's insane. insanity. It's not just that you're spending $400 million in a game. There has to be some polish, some level of, you know, like everything is very generic. It's, it's, it's really shit quality. It's like someone said, hey, let's make this as bad as possible. And that's really <laughs> what they did. And it went through the developer hell. It sort of feels like every person who does their uh, surveys, who does their market and analytics and insights, they don't know what the mm. hell they're doing. Mm. Or they've replaced them with robots or AI bots or something because Possibly. it just seems like it's very disconnected with what the customers Possibly. want. $400 million is a lot of money on a game. You know? I, I didn't think about that. You know, The role of AI in these decisions it, it it only makes a kind of <laughs> kind of makes more sense than a, an actual department of human beings making these decisions. It, it, it is mean, so disconnected. I, I I would not put it past the level of stupidity <laughs> people have as well, right? And when you get a lot of suits in the management team, this isn't something that that could be attributed there. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I agree with your apprehension that could they be this badly disconnected? Yeah, but apparently they are. Yeah, I, Concord is something I'll probably come back to later on in this talk. Towards the end, the last talking point, I'll just tie it back to Concord. Now, what about the PS5 Pro? What are your thoughts? We both are now, finally, finally, we are PS5 the boys, awesome. <laughs> old owners, men, yeah. owners, finally. It's, yeah. it's taken time. Uh, yeah. And to me, uh, look, the PS5, having just got, sorry, man, uh, we just received yeah, yeah. this upgrade from the PS4. Or, or maybe I was just even just just playing the PS3. I was just playing the PS3. Still, like not done with this yet. And then the <laughs> PS4. All right, PS4 comes along the way, and the PS5 was just the upgrade we just got a month ago. Yeah. And now, do we need this? I mean, look, when you think about it, like PS4, there was a PS4 Fat and then the PS4 Slim, right? So the upgrades do come along. I think that's a normal perspective. I do feel like maybe COVID has sort of messed with the, the console life cycle a lot. That's two years that's, that's lost there. But I also think that from a market perspective, it's just the, there's this misconception that these companies have that making good AAA games is not a good investment, right? And the thought process is that making games that are live service, which I understand is a topic we're going to get into, is sort of where the, the focus is, right? But I'm going to the PS5 Pro, I think it's just like, there's just, it isn't a library, enough of a library. Like, in comparison with the Switch, right? I mean, I, I, I have my Switch. I know at the moment that it's filled with at least 10 games that I know I still have to play. In comparison, my PS5, I have one game left to play. Literally, and, and even if I get a, a PSN subscription, it's essentially the same stuff because, lo and behold, Sony took out all the good AAA games. Like, they took out Horizon. I don't understand why you would take out a game that you yourself are the owners of. <laughs> You're not paying a licensing cost. I, at least I hope, correct me if I'm wrong there, but it, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. So, PS5 Pro, $700 or $800? Something, and, something and, around there. And digital edition only. Yep. So no disk drive. <laughs> and when you get on Reddit and all these forms, like, what? why is there no disk drive? Why am I paying so much money for three freaking lines? And then the videos right. of the graphic fidelity difference is just so stupid. <laughs> it's the same thing. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, uh, influencers, uh, YouTubers who are still, who have just begun uh, um, um, you know, advocating for higher fidelity graphics. I just saw, I, I like them. I, but everybody has, you know, their right to have a different opinion. I don't agree. Mm. I do not agree that price justifies just the higher resolution that you get to see on an 8K screen that your you or I are not going to get in this lifetime. I have no ambition to get an 8K, you know, monitor or a television just to play a, an eight hundred dollar uh, PS5 Pro to play PS4 games. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is. There's no market for that sort of meter library. And then it ties back into the development cost, making something of that graphical quality and fidelity is also an investment, right? Mm. And I sort of feel like with indie studios and with how they've made amazing games without actually having to, you know, go crazy with graphics. I, I understand graphics are a great draw. Games are super fun. I remember playing Ghost of Tsushima 
and the graphics blew me away. But then the graphics not only blew me away to a certain extent, right? I had to uh, enjoy, I stayed for the game because of the gameplay and the story, right? It's the same thing with Wukong. It's the same thing with Boulder's Game 3. It, the games are fantastic. They look visually brilliant, but it is the gameplay. It is the story that's going to keep you, right? So I, I don't, doesn't justify paying $800 for a PlayStation, which again, doesn't have a disk drive. And, mm. Uh, mm. and, and, you know, it's and the weird. library. Library, yeah. Steam, I think. And then it's sort of like, you know, when we're having a stop process, it's comparative to Steam, right? So Steam is also a digital library. But Steam is much more different than the PS5, right? And, and the library and what Sony offers. So I don't think, I understand maybe that's the thought process they might have had and why they want to go this way. But they don't really have the library, as you mentioned. They don't have the capability or the, mm. you know, the expansiveness of media to do that. That's the Steam is well established. I get that they want to be competitive with them. But I mean, look, look at, they, they made the PSP. The PSP was a fantastic system. And then they made the PSP, which is an ass of a system, right? And, and then they just gave up. I, I mean, come on. It's sort of like they do they have one failure and then they screw up. They tend to release the Wii U. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, I just had a question for, for yourself before we get too far ahead and, and, I, and I lose the question, sorry. So the question is for you because I, as you know, uh, our our audiences not all, not everybody knows I have not been an active gamer for about a decade more than a, a good decade so just from my own uh, knowledge so Sekiro ghosts ghosts of Tsushima are they are these both uh, and the like are they all PS4 games as well yeah I I, I know Sekiro is a PS4 game I, I think Ghosts of Tsushima is also a PS4 game because I think. Okay. Yeah, I think because the yeah. point is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think so that this is something that was bothering me and I wasn't able to pinpoint. So I, I think for, for somebody like myself, as I said, you know, I, I just graduated 10 years, no games, and I just had I was holding on to the PS3 and not playing it, just having these games, the five, six games right up here, haven't finished most of them and stashed away. Uh, then along come three children, and after three children, I get, you know, some I, I get some time out from myself. Uh, I've earned it. For having been away for 10 years, I get the PS4, which to me is a huge, huge upgrade from the PS3. Uh, again, after having not played for 10 years, right? And uh, and I have access to the PSN now uh, because that is a, 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 an active functioning thing. Uh, discounted prices, amazing. And I'm having a good time with the PS4. I completely skip over the P. And I'm I'm getting I'm a PS4 gamer towards the last leg of the PS4 very last years, last two years of the PS4. I don't even know a PS4 Pro exists. Then I find out, I don't care. It's it's good enough for me. Then we get, yeah. we just got the PS5 a few months ago, a month or so ago. And uh, I mean, I don't really get to see a PS5 as a next generation kind of an upgrade to the PS4 because we are basically playing the same library for, that is for the PS4 as apart from a few exclusives here or there, Astro, you know, uh, some other God of War, Ragnarok, even God of War One was a PS4 game. So basically, I'm just playing PS4 games slightly higher in performance mode, 60 FPS. Some of them, most of them, all right. So to me, the PS5 Pro is, you know, I just got an upgrade, which I don't personally feel is a huge upgrade, and it's just with with a PS5 Pro, slightly better mm -hmm. graphics on a bigger, more expensive screen, but again for the same games. That is a big issue. It's not really a generational shift. It hasn't been one from the PS4 to PS5. It's my hot yeah, take. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree with you. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's sort of like, it seems like Sony had a business plan that they would operate in specific timelines and then COVID kind of just blew mm. a few years out of the water. And, and they said, oh, who cares? We still have to do that because apparently we have to maximize value for our shareholders are realizing that from a longer term business perspective, they're actually losing out. Because I, I, I based on the reaction I've seen online, like I don't see people ordering a PS5 Pro, right? Considering considering that the PS5 is still a bit one, one, much, much better selling than the Xbox, right? Without question. They're mm -hmm. doing amazing, they're doing great mm -hmm. in sales. Considering just a couple of years ago, they weren't available in the market, right? It was just an annoyance just to find yeah. one. So they're doing well, they're getting sales and games are finally starting to come out that are actually pretty good, you know, 
it, it, the timing is off in my opinion. I mm -hmm. think it wasn't a necessity. There's no value to I it. Agree. I agree. But it's sort of like the all the decision making, it feels like it's being driven by just how can we get our numbers up? Mm. Not in, and it's short term instead of long term, right? Like the conversations on the PS6, I'm like, please, guys, come on. And let's not even get into that, right? <laughs> I mean, look at Nintendo Switch coming out with Nintendo Switch 2. Now, I, I mean, it makes sense. Mm. There's been enough time. They put in an OLED version, which is not like a huge upgrade, but it's a better screen. And now, and, and, and the games in the Switch, just in comparison, they have pushed the boundary, right? Look at uh, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. They really pushed that device like crazy. And playing games like that on Hell and Hell is amazing. But I don't see that with the PlayStation. Then they have the PlayStation Portal and all these gimmicky devices. It's yeah. like they don't really know, understand what they're doing, or, or they mm -hmm. just don't seem to understand what the customers are. But that's, I think, my hot take, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. handhelds now, they're, they're too late to the party. You have Steam Deck, you have all these other things that are in the market that it's not competitive. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I think just to summarize the point, it's less about the system and more about the library, right? That is what these companies, I think, are forgetting. And, and not not just yeah, and not just the size of the library, but the quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean we can they, just keep they, on going. You know, we can keep on going and also get Microsoft and Game Pass library into the mix. But you know, <laughs> the point has the point has been made. I believe. Oh yeah, Moving on. question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun topic. Yeah, and and it ties into the Concord discussion as well. Yeah. I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I I don't know. I I I I see live service games, and the only thing that comes to my mind is hot take. Uh, there is no other way to review live service games as you know the the way they are structured. They're they're for somebody who's uh, who's now paying uh, you know three kids, you know all those expenses. Uh, I have been actually very actively keeping my kids away from live service games, knowing the way they function, you know, it starts off as a freebie, but then you got to pay to win, pay to level up and all that, that, that kind of a marketing model uh, does not appeal to me as a gamer, does not appeal to me as a parent of future gamers. I, I get it, you know, look, let's be honest, right? If, if we were both sitting at the top of company and, that company was MiHoYo, and we had a game called Genshin Impact, and its uh, current worldwide spending since 2020 is $3.7 billion, which is approximately $6 million a day, by the way. We would <laughs> also say, yes, yes, let's let's do this, let's do this. Yes, but, Every game but, should be but, service. <laughs> but understandably, the thing that these companies miss out on is that the cost for running that game has ballooned up to $900 million. It is, in, a sen in essence, one of the most expensive games to maintain in history. So the, the profit comes with a cost, you know, and then you have resources and people working on it 24-7, the creativity, you know, the limitation, and, and it's all there. So while I understand the appeal behind it, people need to understand that they're not going to have a banger, right? Not everyone's going to have an amazing game out of the gate, like Genshin and Genshin. Genshin Impact has had tons of clones, Tower of God, Wuthering Waves, all these other games. I think, well, you yeah. know, they, they, they have not hit that same level of profitability because there is something magical in what Genshin Impact has done. It's the same thing with the other game, Hong Kong Star, right? It's, it's, it's just something that sets it apart. The quality of production, the content, the overall library, Yes, they are predatory. Without question, these games are predatory. Mm -hmm. Without service games, mm -hmm. will always be predatory, right? Mm -hmm. And I understand that from a revenue perspective, having a continuous take of profit every month is great for your business line, bottom line, great for your business numbers, great for your shareholders, right? Because you're constantly showing growth. And that subscription model, does, there is value in that. But it has to be a diversified mix. You cannot have only subscription-based games where you cannot bet mm -hmm. so much money on a subscription-based games when you when your consumer testing should have very clearly told you that this game looks like ass, it plays like ass, and it is ass. <laughs> but <laughs> apparently, Sony never got the memo. So while I understand that you, you're right. not a fan of it, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I do the see consumer. The, your business sense. Yeah. yeah, as a consumer. But yeah, I, I, I do see and to your point, exactly. I know as, but again, to your point, but from the consumer's perspective, I feel very perplexed and it frustrates me to see 
every developer jumping ship and just has to, they just, each developer has to have a live service game. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it, it just doesn't appeal to me. I find it very frustrating to keep up with uh, that trend. And certainly, um, you know, and certainly every game is live service. And it's creeping uh, uh, into other non-live service games as in the form of microtransactions without which battle passes, you know, yeah. uh, fi fighter passes, Street Fighter Six, and frustrates me to no end. Uh, but that is another topic to discuss for uh, that's going to be an, an entirely separate section, I think. Yeah, us, maybe uh, I'll, I'll, yeah that's going to be a whole other rant <laughs> video, guest starring myself and myself, me, myself, and I. Yeah, but look, look I, I, on that point, I opened up Switch, uh, sorry, Twitch right now, right? So, right. Grand Theft Auto V, the online version, like Fortnite, Valorant, Dota right. 2, Overwatch 2, you know, Warzone, uh, Escape from Tarkov, Sea of Thieves. PUBG, I, I this uh, Apex Legends, I guess I don't know. Oh so yeah, like all these games that are there, they're all live service. So it's sort of like these companies do want have this thought process that hey, maybe ours will be a hit, and then we we'll start mm -hmm. making this kind of money. Because the revenue to profit, right, the uh, the cost to profit ratio is really really good, and the business case makes sense. But then. Mm -hmm there's a certain amount of time that players have, right? And there's a certain amount of time that they can dedicate. So unless mm -hmm. your game is a huge success, you cannot just expect that to happen. So while mm -hmm. I see the appeal in it, I, I feel like it has to be a good diversified mix. Look at Golder here, look at Wukong. They made, I think Wukong, what, first two weeks, $600 million? That's fantastic. That's true. <laughs> and and, and Golders get three. Times. Baldur's Gate 3 was an exceptional example of a good AAA game, right? Right, um, right. Uh, yeah. Which, which yeah. doesn't have to be live service, right? It's a standalone, yeah. that's the game. Yeah. Exactly. So Baldur's Gate, uh, 657 million just from Steam, right? Right. And across all platforms, it's already cost a billion dollars. So, I mean, make a good quality game. And the irony of it all is when Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 3 came out, Developers had the audacity to say, "Oh, don't expect this to be the quality or the quality or standard of games we'll be seeing." Like, dude, are it's not the real? benchmark. <laughs> yeah, like, what the hell are you talking about? This is exactly what should be the benchmark. At this least. is where your game seems to be at a bare minimum, or you should aspire to be. Yeah, like they they already said that. Oh no, we we can't put in this much effort because we're a bunch of shitheads, and we don't we don't want to we don't want to put in this much effort on making a game a good game. So that's why you have all these quality shitty life service games. It's, it's feedback like this that uh, you know takes me back in time, back to the back to the days of the NES and Super NES. You would have that official Nintendo seal of quality. If that is not there, you yeah. know the game is trash. Even though you know, even though we we have had trash games even then with the seal of quality, yeah. but it made it made a lot of difference to have that to see that. And now it's like, nah, it's okay. <laughs> We're so gonna make my, trash, my, and you're gonna buy it anyway. That's the mentality. Yeah, that, that is a thought process. But my my opinion is that live service games, while are certain, some are good, they'll always be predatory. They'll always require money, uh, a constant investment, and there needs to be a diversified process. For Sony in particular, they have Final Fantasy fourteen on them. It's gonna do really well. They're constantly making money, so focus on building that as your core live service game. Right. Build other games around it, but. Then the complaint is, oh, yeah, Final Fantasy 16 online did not perform the expectations, even though it's making a profit. So then their expectations were wrong. Uh, a side, side note of, on this topic, on the live service games topic, was this really a trend that started thanks to cell phones? I, I don't think yeah, Accessibility I, I don't... is a thing, mm -hmm. right? But we'd have to, I think, just to answer the question, I have to really look at, like, what are the user base? Say, for example, Genshin Impact, right? Are the majority of the users on which platform? So, Impact user platform. I'm just curious, you know, is did live service games it become a thing thanks to thanks to cell phones? PUBG is a cell phone game, uh, basically. Uh, maybe Genshin was also perhaps on cell phone, and the, the yeah. trend of free games with the uh, you know. Uh, here you can level buy this to level up your character or buy this to uh, get a new skill 
well, you know, the microtransaction, the, the gimmick, did it really, yeah. uh, um, uh, what's the word? Did it really, uh, phew, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I, have my I think it blew up because of mobile phones. I, I do agree. Because when you so. look at the revenue, right? Split for Genshin Impact. So iOS is 2.4 billion. Android is 1.3 billion. And then PC is 700 billion. So it's it's pretty clear that mobile phones have had a big impact on this. And I mean, look, when you go out in the market, you see all these people playing PUBG or Fortnite on their phones. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it, I, think, I think it's pretty apparent that people, oh. the mobile phones, the accessibility, right? Because look, not everyone has a PC, not everyone has a PlayStation 5 or a 4 or that, but everyone has a phone. So I do agree accessibility is, it has been what's been the driving factor for live service games. But it takes mm -hmm. us before this, absolutely. You know, you had WoW, you had Final Fantasy XIV, mm -hmm. you had uh, Final Fantasy XI, you had you know, what were the other games, Guild Wars, and all these other right. things that were there. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shall we? Next topic. Yeah, yeah. Subscri <laughs> subscription <laughs> game library. So, we, we have I, both. I, I, this is more you than me. <laughs> No, no, we've both used Game Pass extensively. We have had a look at the entire Game Pass library. I look at it uh, every now and then, and I shut it down. <laughs> There's nothing in there that <laughs> appeals to me as a 46-year-old gamer who's been through, you know, hasn't played for 10 years, but I know the types of games I want to play, so Game Pass doesn't offer those to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. The PS Plus offered great value uh, in terms of the games I wanted to play, but as you say, then those games are taken off off the uh, library, yeah. which surprisingly Microsoft doesn't do. They still have Gears of War, all of them. They still have Halo, all of them. The Microsoft first party games are on Game Pass. Whether you like them or not, yeah. you, you get them, which is good, which was a yeah. thing we were, we were expecting and we were seeing from Sony, but now it's not there. Yeah. yeah. But then look, you, you, the other thought process is that uh, Microsoft, Sony's games, once you download them from the Game Pass, even if they go away, we still have access to them. Microsoft, if they go away, but well, your access is gone. They, they gatekeep it. You're, you're done. So they, 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 their accessibility, their accessibility and their rules for their subscription is kind of crappy. Sony has a nice subscription model, but I think the price increase recently has turned up a lot of people. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. Absolutely. Uh, I'd be <laughs> one of those. And then overall, the quality of content. It has not been good. I think what this time around that Harry Potter Quidditch or something like that. I'm like, come on, man. I don't want to play Quidditch. Current month's games are terrible. I mean, I was looking at them with Salman with my kids, and we were like, we we don't want to play a single one of these, both for Game Pass, but especially also for uh, the PS Plus, where we would expect at least one big name, one big game to be there this month. Psh, nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. It's sort of like when it ties in back to the original conversation that. There is a significant lack of good gaming content, and, and, and that is driving uh, these organizations to not be able to offer that that service in the subscription. But the subscription model is very profitable. I mean, it's really, really good money, and it's continuous money, right? The thing is, you buy a game once, that's it. You're done. Subscription and live service. There's a constant requirement of revenue, and that is a change yeah. in business model globally, right? Everyone's trying to do it. I mean. BMW and Mercedes are locking features of a car and Audi behind a subscription. So I, I, I mean, everyone's trying trying their best to stick it in there. I think Logitech was trying to sell a forever mouse, but you have to pay a subscription to use it. So it, it, it's 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 a global phenomenon. But I do feel that it's it's just not going to work for certain industries, and you're antagonizing your customers. Like that's why I, I being a new user, Steam. I'm really happy with it because mm -hmm. the library is amazing. The deals are better, right? That that's the biggest thing. They have better deals, and then based on some stats that were recently leaked, Steam has a very small team, right? Which, is, which I think also benefits them in terms of their ability to you know, mm -hmm. offer the the prices they can, and and they have really good leadership. I think that's also very important. Mm -hmm. The suits are not screwing things up at Steam for the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, it's usually uh, the way we have seen it's just a matter of time, but for the moment, yeah, I agree. Let me just bring up. Let me just bring up the uh, Steam. I I I have it uh, right here. And how about this? This is a point I really wanted to talk to. I wanted to uh, find some. Uh, I wanted to have somebody like yourself speak some sense to me. Uh, talk some sense into my head. And when you have Xbox, Microsoft themselves, 
you know, who, who, who are making these games and these games are available for a lower price on Steam than if you buy the same game on a PC from the Microsoft store or on the, uh, uh, my, uh, or on the Xbox. We just got off a, a sale, similar sale, a Sony publisher sale, uh, God yeah, of War, yeah. all of those games. Uh, well, Sony has a different pricing strategy, but Steam offers us uh, and everybody around the world regional pricing. And we happen to be in the region where game prices are heavily discounted for us uh, consumers yeah. who are in this region. You don't get to see these prices on Xbox. Uh, this game just came out. You don't get to see yeah. this price on Xbox. Uh, so and, and Xbox themselves, Microsoft is making these games available. Sony also on Steam. Yeah. My question is, the sense I need you to speak to me is, why should I keep a console if I can have these games on my PC? The honest answer, you have no reason to. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's pretty apparent, right? That the companies, obviously, they see that this is an untapped market, right? Which is strange considering Microsoft all offers uh, Game Pass on their you know, subscription as well. But the right. reality is that this is a market that they are tapping into, and this is where they are positively impacting their bottom line. So, again, the business perspective makes sense, but it just goes to show you that how uh, proliferant uh, Steam is, that it's just all over the place, it has a great market uh, that it's captured, it generally just has awesome that real games, the sensibility is fantastic, they don't have stupid region locks, they don't have mm. stupid PSN requirements or Xbox right. requirements. You go, you buy the game, you play, right? I mean, I wonder if Steam has ever thought about releasing a subscription model. Fingers crossed they don't listen to this video and, <laughs> and decide to do that, but I feel don't like- Don't subscribe, they're... Steam. Do not subscribe <laughs> to this channel. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do feel like they, they have this, this market that, that is something everyone wants to tap into, right? Like, so for example, let's say we're selling something, right? And we have two different markets. We have the Sony market, the Xbox market, the Nintendo market, sorry, four, and in the Windows market, right? For me, the largest, originally, I would think, depending on the quality of game and the compatibility, Switch would be a good one, right? Because of the hand company. Then if I had to pick between Steam, Sony, and PC, I would pick PC. Mm. Just, just generally speaking, because mm. I feel like the PC is a really good market, it's easily accessible. Great value. Yeah, great for us, yeah. for us in this region, no, no better value. Yeah, and, and and the best part is there's all the exclusive content, exclusive content, it's up on Steam. So uh, why why should I buy a console? Yeah, it, it's sort of like Steam has kind of oh, put sorry. the case yeah. in front that no worries that why why do you guys need to buy a account a console? I mean, it, it is true. It's sort of like it's really really made the case for that. And this is what I think the the suits in uh in the Sony executive boardroom and the Microsoft boardroom, that's what they're sweating. That hey Steam has everything. What do we do now? Yeah the, here's the sale I was talking about. So you've you've got yeah. the games made by the company who is making the console and mm. the games are right here. And if you have a decent PC, they will work just fine. These, these these were heavily discounted. This was for $13 just last week, a few a few days ago, $19 okay. this one. I mean, and this game is here for now. Yeah. And yeah, I understand Sony is not offering us regional pricing, but still these sales keep happening more frequently than they happen on the PlayStation itself or on Game Pass itself. More frequently. These are all the exclusives. And these are all the exclusives made by the, exactly, yes. Yes, my point so, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it, I get it. it. It doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, third-party so, games are here anyway. We we have the yeah. Resident Evils, we have the Street Fighters, we have the King of uh, Fatal Furies, we have those everywhere. But the exclusives are also here. So what is the, <laughs> you know, on more frequent sale points, sale prices than on the console itself? It's yeah. game over. Basically. I, it's a no-brainer. I mean, today on on the RPG Reddit. The, there were the, there were all these Sony and all these sales going on, right? And people, the posts were uh, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch. And then they had to put in a separate post for Steam because there are so many games. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's just the, the sheer volume of content available. And not just shoveler content, like good content has just made Steam better. 
So it seems like the subscription game libraries aren't really offering much in comparison to Steam. Because mm -hmm. I think over time, the cost does normalize, right? The $130 or $50 you're paying a year, if you combine it with all the sales that you Games you buy on Steam, it's more or less a problem. So, uh, Boulder's Gate was for $15. I mean, come on, that's a month off subscription exactly. for Xbox and PlayStation, but that's a freaking AAA game, best game of the year, without question, I think. And, exactly. And that you may or may not get in the subscription library. And if you do, it'll just be taken off after a few months yeah. and it's gone. I think it's like half the price on Steam. On PlayStation, Sony, it's like seventy dollars. It's like exactly. half that price on Steam. But why would I buy it on PlayStation then? It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. No, it does not make any sense. You know, it and that this actually has been a reason for me to discontinue my Game Pass first, and now also not continue uh, by uh, PlayStation Plus subscription any longer. Because first of all, yeah, the the there's a price increase for both of them. Okay, sure. But then for somebody who doesn't have a lot of time to play the whole time, we, we get to play only when we do get to play, you know, responsibilities, family, work. Um, and when we do get to play, we find that, okay, so now I have time today. Oops, time just ran out. The game got delisted from Game Pass last week or whatever, you know, Horizon is gone now. You're too late. Yeah. So there's always this pressure on us to go and play the games. But, you know, you can just pay for less than half price on Steam. Wait for the sale. It's fine. We can wait. I'm 50. I can wait for another, I don't know what, I don't need to, I, I have nothing to do but wait now. My prime gaming years are gone behind me. I can sit and wait for the next sale. If I miss it, I'll wait for the next sale or the next one and I'll pay a fraction of the price and I'll be very happy. Because yeah, both of us have a backlog. I think every single gamer in the world has a backlog right now. Huge. So yeah, huge. The, it, it's, it's just pretty clear that you can easily wait for a sale, you know? So yeah, I think it's uh, Steam has pretty much B have has the competition B, and yeah. Sony and Microsoft really need to think about reinventing this model because I think they're gonna keep on bleeding numbers. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. If anybody is out there, you know, pro tip, free advice. You know, we have <laughs> 40, 50 minutes of uh, free advice for Sony and Microsoft in this video. Last but not the least, what has happened to creativity in games? Oh, Where man. did it all go? Or is it still there? I think it's still there. I, I just think uh, my opinion is that uh, the time to fruition has gone longer because the overall development process has increased. And then particularly outside of the major studios, you have to look at the indie studios for the creativity, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Hi-Fi Rush, fantastic game, amazing creativity. Undertale was one of the best games you know, I played and you know, no, no, it does not drive, require PS5 Pro fidelity <laughs> to run that game, right? And uh, then there's tons of really Ori that was shown on the Xbox sales fantastic right. platform, or Great Metroidvania, right. lots of little indie games that are like absolutely mm -hmm. Stardew Valley, come on, Terraria, Terraria is an indie game as well, like all these really, really fantastic indie games that have been fantastic. And, mm -hmm. and there's creativity there. It sort of feels like creativity has disappeared from the big AAA industry. And, yeah, and the quality of work as well, by the way. Thank you. Looking at you right now, Bioware. Okay. <laughs> and it's sort of just gone, trickled down to these smaller indie studios, and they're the ones who are basically making all, taking these creative risks and building up these games. And look at Castlevania. Uh, the, and I can't recall the guy's name. Uh, Sugar, I think. No. Uh, Koji Igarashi, Igarashi, yeah, Igarashi, yeah. He had to make his own studio to continue mm -hmm. with Castlevania games because Konami is high on some kind of drugs. I don't know. And uh, like they're, they're repackaging all his old games and selling them as bundles. But Bloodstain, for all his graphical issues, was a fantastic game. It's pretty great. Other pretty games, great. That, yeah, pretty great. I thoroughly enjoyed the game, and it's the same with Kojima. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Konami, again. <laughs> Konami's out of their minds, you know? So it sort of feels like the people that want to be creative, they can no longer be creative in the larger studios because they mm -hmm. no longer want to give that physical space to be creative. Mm -hmm. and, and now they're dependent on doing home studios and doing indie games to really build up their creativity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think it may also be a factor of us, or at least myself, having been playing games for so long and having just become old, having just become an old gamer now. I, I still remember the very first time playing Contra and figuring out after a half hour of just pow, pow, losing and dying and dying, figuring out, oh, I could press down to crouch and the bullet goes over my head was a mind-blowing revelation. And, you know, that uh, level of that... Uh, um, uh, level of uh, charm and uh, you know uh, getting blown away by something as simple as pressing down and oh you can you can dodge bullets and you know it'll go over your head that kind of wow factor uh, I kind of felt a little bit in that uh, when uh, you introduced me to Astro's playroom so that was very interesting the way you, know, you could use the controller in different ways and Astro you know the way they have integrated that into the game so that, that was that was interesting but it has just been such a long time since I've had that feeling of excitement and a game just blowing me away by yeah. its me you know, some mechanic source, creativity yeah, so at that level. I, I, I have my opinion. Again, so I, I feel that it's, it's studio dependent, right? So I'll give two examples and maybe a third one, depending on the second <laughs> example. So we talk about games like uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I know you haven't played that, right? Mm. But Mechanically, there was a lot to discover, but I had to actually watch a 40-minute video to understand how the combat in my game worked because it was so ridiculously not complex, but just was not explained in that way, right? So I feel like that that discovery, it, it does change also. Like now gamers no longer want to go through that process of discovery as well because technically mm -hmm. speaking, everything's available online in any case, right? Mm -hmm. But then it's also on how it's applied. Like I feel like from software, does an amazing job. Best example being Sekiro Shadow Sight Twice. Mechanically, not a complex perspective, the deflection. But mastering it, and as soon as you get it, the game completely changes. Like, I, I died so many times in, like, the first couple, four or five hours of the game. And then I just spend a little bit of time just really trying to understand how it worked. And as soon as it clicked, the game became so much fun. Like I cannot put into words how much fun that game was. And it was, it's like that, you know, that one mechanic was sort of refined to such a level that it completely like made that game. Like bosses I was struggling on, I, I reformed them and like, oh my God, this is super easy now. Now I understand. <laughs> and then you have to look at Elden Ring as well, right? Elden right. Ring was completely creative, innovative, and it's a triple A studio. Mm. So I feel like there are developers that still want to do it, but the problem again goes back into the challenge of profitability. It has to make money and you can't mm. take this risk. Mm. And then you have a perfect example of the, where that risk taking is with Concord. So it, it's sort of like the studios have, have lost touch with their industry and the market. And they sort of feel like that creativity is now reserved for live service games and not so much the AAA games. While the inverse is true. Uh, so that that's sort of my take on it. Oh, interesting. I, I agree with with that on so many on so many levels. I agree. Mm. Well, that's a very interesting thought. Well, oh, that that opens up my mind to different ways of thinking about uh, games and the way uh, they. And, and it makes me want to play Sekiro first of all. First of all, so I need to stop playing Ghost of Tsushima, pick up Sekiro first. Like, you just marketed that game to me. <laughs> I, I I think Nintendo for the longest time has been the flag bearer of creativity in terms of, you know, uh, uh, introducing a, uh, something with, that was entirely a gimmick in the form of a Wii and then just taking that to a whole other level until it became stale and then Wii U and that took taking that to a whole other level, yeah, which is... Uh, Nintendo also is a topic that we will discuss next time. But yeah, for the longest time, for me, Nintendo has been the flag bearer, bearer of creativity, and 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 ever since I just stopped playing and just coming back, everything just feels so stale and mundane. And at a certain level, and clearly, I have not been playing the games that you have, which I will now. So yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Well, uh, I'd like to close out because this is the last slide, and it is. Close that out by stopping sharing the screen and just zooming into your face as right. you float about in <laughs> outer in space, strat yeah. stratosphere. Yeah. 
And this yeah. is something that, you know, I, I'm thinking I, uh, when we started out, I wasn't sure if this is something we could do uh, again, but I feel like maybe we can. And I actually feel like maybe we can invite somebody else also to share mm-hmm. their thoughts and mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. where we can take all of this. Uh, I have okay. a couple of people like I'm thinking about with whom mm-hmm. our time zones also match up. So it, it could marry up very, very, very nicely. So thank you for your time today. No, no, of course. And, and while we close, I, I do want to leave you with one final thought. Uh, MiHoYo, the company uh, behind Game Genie back at Hong Kong Star Rail, has funded and built a nuclear reactor, which is now operational. Oh, so I, this was a question I was going to ask you, actually. The uh, Genshin Impact developer is the only game that they do is is it just Genshin Impact, nothing else? No, they have a couple of games. Genshin Impact, uh, Honkai Impact, the third, or Honkai Star. Oh, Honkai is, that's also theirs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. So they yeah. specialize in this, in this yeah, kind of... Uh... They they have the formula down, but but I think out of all the games, the two that are commercial are very good commercial success are Honkai Star and like Genshin Impact, not the other two. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. That's it. so. It, it actually, uh, you know, it, it takes me back again to the first, uh, second talking point is that you know every company jumping into the life service uh, scene doesn't make any sense unless you specialize in that. Case in point, the people who can make build a nuclear nuclear reactor out of their sails. I mean, versus yeah. what? Sony? I don't think so. Yeah, I think Sony is just going to be too busy making Morbius too. So. <laughs> <laughs> After right, that, man. Madam Web debacle, someone needs to be fired, man. <laughs> well, this this has just uh, turned out to be longer than what we initially thought. Fifteen minutes is like more than an hour now. <laughs> someone has some editing work to do. <laughs> no, no, this is going just as it is. All right, man. All right. Take care. Have a take good care. one. Thanks. I'll catch you. Bye. 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 Bye.